Welcome to the Details of Life. I'm your host, Marcus Wilson. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, I just got to say thank you for coming back and spending some time with me today. I know that you guys noticed that I didn't release an episode on Sunday. I had got you guys in a habit of every Wednesday, Sunday. But really, this was designed to be a weekly podcast. And the reason we were doing Wednesday, Sunday, because we were in quarantine. And I knew that there were going to be quite a few people that desired more content. And I had more time to do it at home. And so that's why that happened. But we're going to go back to weekly. It's just going to be on Wednesdays. Tuesday nights for subscribers. So if you aren't a subscriber yet, subscribe. You'll get a notification and get access on Tuesday night. But we're going to go back on Wednesdays. And here we are with our next guest, Notre Dame head coach, Mike Bray. You know, I was really excited about bringing Coach Bray on because I'm from South Bend. Many of you know that I'm a big Notre Dame football fan. I wasn't always the biggest Notre Dame basketball fan. Since Coach Bray has gotten there, that's all changed. Since 2000, out of the the 19 years, been to the tournament 17 years, three three sixteens two Elite Eights, won the 2015 ACC Championship, has just been getting it done. 417 wins at Notre Dame, 516 total. And he was the 2007 and 2008 Big East Coach of the Year, as well as 2011 when he got National Coach of the Year. So the guy just gets it done. You know, he has the has the resume from Final Fours to winning in high school, winning in college. One of the questions I was really excited to ask him about was, how does the academic requirements in Notre Dame affect recruiting? You know, you always hear about Notre Dame and Stanford and Vanderbilt and Northwest and all their fans always say, well, we can't get all the guys that other schools can get because of our academic restrictions. And I was really excited about asking him that. And he gave a good answer. So I know you'll learn a little bit from that. But overall, just a great guy. Um, We covered a lot of topics, obviously covered what's going on with the team, um, expectations and things like that, culture of the team, how he's been able to turn some things around. So a lot to learn from one of the best coaches in the business. So without further ado, let's go ahead and chime in with Notre Dame head coach. Mike Brick. Ladies and gentlemen, like I just prefaced, we have Notre Dame head men's basketball coach joining the details of life today. Uh, Mike Bray, how you doing, Coach Bray? Marcus, I'm doing great. Um, everything's good up here in your hometown. The sun is out. It's a beautiful day. And uh, we're just trying to stay safe and healthy, but all good. Awesome. Awesome, man. So thank you for making the time to join us and we'll go ahead and dive right in. You know, one of the first things I wanted to ask you is, you know, looking at your coaching career, you got into college coaching um, at Duke. I mean, that's a dream. Seems like a dream job to be your first assistant job. So how did that happen? How did that transpire to get to get to that level? And then also, you know, you were there from 87 to leave 95, won a couple of national championships, six final four. So How did you get there? And then, you know, what was your time like there at at Duke? You know, I was really fortunate, Marcus, in that I I played at DeMatha High School for Morgan Wooten. God rest his soul. We lost him in January. He was 88, had a great life. And then I went back and coached with him after I finished my uh, playing career at George Washington University. And we had a lot of good players at DeMatha, which meant a lot of guys were coming through to recruit. And here I am, a young guy. I developed relationships with Dean Smith, Lefty Giselle, Terry Holland, John Thompson, Mike Krzyzewski. You know, you you name it, they came through. And I was fortunate in that when Mike Krzyzewski had an opening on his staff in 1987, he wanted a young guy that was going to be with him a while, not a guy who was just coming to maybe punch the clock and get a head job in a year or two. I needed time. And I was there for eight years. And, and as you mentioned, Marcus, it was a magical run. Six of the eight years I was there, we went to the Final Four. That was the Hurley, Leitner, Grant Hill, you know, time, which was just, you know, uh, it was magical. It was, it was amazing. And what I'm always very indebted to Mike Kay in that when he hired me, he said, I don't want anybody coming down here who doesn't want to be a head coach one day, which I think really prepared me when I became a head coach at the University of Delaware in 1995. When you have those type of experiences and you were already a champion at, at, at the high school level, then to get that, that experience at college, of, like you said, you went to Delaware for five years, got two more American East titles, two more tournaments, appearances, but then you get the head coaching job at Notre Dame, which I'm excited to talk about. And so you got to Notre Dame, Notre Dame hadn't been to the tournament in 10 years, right? So as you're a head coach coming in, having all that success uh, for some of the coaches out there that are thinking about, you know, where they're taking over a program, what are some of the things that 
are going through your mind and what are some of the things that you, a, a coach does when they're taking over a program that hasn't had a lot of you know, recent success? You know, the interesting thing about Notre Dame was I tried to get the job in 1999 and I didn't make the cut. They hired Matt Doherty, who in one year really did a heck of a job here in South Bend. And all of a sudden, he goes back to North Carolina and the job's open again. Never in my wildest dreams that I thought it would come. I always thought I'd be a good fit at a place like Notre Dame, given how I was trained at a really good school at Duke and the recruiting pool that you need to deal with. I had no idea when I took the job that we had not been to the NCAA tournament in 10 years. I knew maybe we hadn't, I knew Notre Dame was down a little bit, but at 10 years, I was very fortunate to inherit from John McLeod, God rest his soul, and Matt Doherty. We had good players who were ready to make a run. Heck, I I inherited Troy Murphy as a junior. Uh, Harold Swanigan was, was on that roster. Ryan Humphrey was getting eligible. He was sitting out and getting eligible. Martin Inglesby, Matt Carroll, David. We had an NSA tournament team, and the timing was, and I, I felt the pressure was, just don't screw this up, Mike, because these guys are older, and they're going to get a tournament bid. And we ended up winning the West Division of the Big East. We got back to the tournament for the first time in 10 years, and it was really special. We were in Kansas City. We beat Xavier. We lost to Ole Miss, Mississippi, in the second round. But, um, you know, you, you, that, that, those old guys, and two of them are on my coaching staff, Harold Swanigan and Ryan Humphrey, they kind of helped create the culture of, you know, trying to get to the tournament every year and playing the right way, sharing the ball and, and, and playing fast. You know, we've created a, a culture like that. We've, I've had a great succession plan because I don't get one and dones. We have guys that are going to be here with me. So I always have juniors and seniors that are vested in the program. And boy, do they help you. When they're leading and selling the message, it takes a lot of pressure off the coach. This past year, TJ Gibbs, Johnny Mooney, Rex Fluger were fabulous as captains. They, they kind of helped me run the locker room when I wasn't around. So um, I, I've, I've loved the culture we've had established. I mean, God, this will be 21 years I'm coming up on. We were in the Big East, and now we're in the ACC. And, and, and I've had a number of guys come and go, and they're all like sons to you. But um, it, it's a neat culture of a succession plan. We feel guys get better here. You know, they get better. Uh, there's a freedom to play on the offensive end. We've never wanted to overcoach. So we've kind of created a culture that I'm, that I'm excited about. And uh, – Hopefully we can maintain it because I do like our young players coming back. Yeah, I mean, you've been doing a heck of a job, obviously, and changing that culture. I think one thing that you hit on and is really important to, to, to talk about is you do get, end up getting juniors and seniors. And in this culture of wanting to leave to the NBA early, when you can get guys who have been around three, four years, player-led teams are so much better. Uh, like you said, they lead the culture in the locker room, and then they also get physically stronger over years. And so exactly right. I see how you – turn it around like that. So with that being said, I want to talk about another turnaround. Um, you know, your first 13 years, uh, 14 years, you made the NCAA tournament. So we're going to skip to 2014, 15. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up for the people that don't know much about you in that time, you won three uh, conference coach of the years back to back in 07, 08 national coach of the year in 11. So we're skipping over a lot of really good stuff, but I can only have you for so long today, but for the coaches out there that have had bad seasons one season and they're looking to turn around, you missed, you know, I bring the season up because in the first yes. 14 years, it was the first year that you didn't make postseason play. Then the next year you come back, have one of the best seasons, 32 wins, first of back-to-back -back Elite Eight appearances. What transpired over that summer to make that dramatic turnaround to go from missing the tournament to the Elite Eight? Great question. And – even most recently, we're kind of trying to regain momentum, you know, because um, our first year in the ACC wasn't very fun. Um, we got pushed around, kicked around, and we got eliminated from the ACC tournament so fast, it was amazing. The difference was Jaron Grant and Pat Connaughton as senior captains coming back and setting the tone. We went to Italy on a foreign tour after that really down year. And you could see Connaughton and Grant taking hold of the group to bounce back. And it was amazing how we bounced back. And 
ended up winning the ACC. And then if you look at us since then, that we lose Connaughton and Grant with a Bonzi Colson and a Demetrius Jackson, our local product from Marion High School, we go back to the Elite Eight, you know, and then, and then, and then we, and then we go again. And then in these last three years, we missed, you know, we, Bonzi got hurt a couple of years ago. We were the first team out. Um, then two years ago, we had a very similar season to 13 and 14, played young guys and got our butts kicked. This year, I was thrilled that we got some momentum back. You know, we won 20 games. We probably were an NIT team, you know, when they pulled the plug at the ACC tournament. But I really kind of like, you know, try, we're getting our momentum back. But it, it's such a great teaching point for young people when they've been put on the mat and had their butts kicked. It's such a character builder. And, and I know we have a lot of great courses at Notre Dame you can take a, a, as a student. I don't think there's any better course than having your butt kicked one season, being put on the mat, and you learn how to come together and bounce back and handle adversity. That's life lesson stuff. And I I would hope the guys that I've had that went through that can look back and use that as a reference point when things are tough with their job or their family or with freaking COVID, right, or whatever, and say, you know what? We got each other's back. We're going to get through this. So, um, the, the ups and downs of it are, are so interesting, but I do feel right now we've got our momentum going back in a, in, in a good way. Yeah, I definitely think so. And you're making a good point about that. We, even in some of the things I do non basketball related in programs I do with teens, I tell them, you know, this may teach you how to, you don't want to get comfortable with failing, but you need to learn how to fail and get back up. Right. And it shows something, some, some grit about yourself when you're able to pick yourself up come back, learn from your mistakes and come back better. You're right. There's, there's not many life lessons better than that. Many people know that you're considered one of the nicest guys in the business, you know, and I, I can testify to that, you know, just in our communication of organizing this, but some of the other things you do, you know, you, you served on coaches versus cancer national council, American heart association, national advisory board of positive coaching Alliance. And in 2019, 20, you just assumed the presidency of a national association of basketball coaching. So I, you know, why, why, why do you give so much back to the game? You have enough responsibilities as a head coach in Notre Dame, but then you add some of these other responsibilities. Why do you give so much back to the game, and where does that desire to give back come from? Well, it's a great question. I mean, you know, the platforms we have coaching at this level, you know, you, you can really do a lot of good. And I started the two charities here in Michiana, Coaches Versus Cancer and our American Heart uh, Association charities. Uh, because both situations, before before COVID, you know, heart disease and cancer were two areas where it touched all of us. Um, and we do annual fundraisers there. With our Coaches Versus Cancer, we've raised over $3 million in this town since its inception in 2002, which, you know, for our community, that is a lot of money for our community. And, and I'm hoping we can have our August events. I'm hoping we can do that and 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 go forward on that. I got involved with our coach association. I just rotated off the presidency. I was president for a year. Jamie Dixon of Texas Christian is the new president, but you know, still very involved in issues to try and help our game. And the transfer issue is something as you're plugged into that has been a hot topic and rules and different things. So I've just felt, you know, to give back. I, I was I guess I always go back to my roots. You know, I was trained as a high school teacher and coach, not being too far away from the day-to-day with our young people, which lately is by way of Zoom. You know, that's the best it gets. And we try and do it weekly with our current team because they're struggling. They're hurting. They're home, and we don't interact with each other as much. And They don't know when they're coming back, and they're, they're having a hard time finding a gym. And But, no, I think helping outside of your bubble of being the basketball coach when you can is – is certainly a key. Awesome, man. Thank you for doing that for the game and then also just for the local community in South Bend. I know they appreciate that. One of the questions I'm really excited to ask, and uh, being from South Bend, may, I hear about this a lot, but, you know, people always talk about the academic restrictions some high academic schools have, like Notre Dame, Northwestern, Vanderbilt, Stanford. So for people who have heard that and heard about how you may or may not be able to get certain recruits in. Could you explain how the academic standards at Notre Dame 
affect your recruiting process? I, I feel that our academic standards are a positive in that they identify a pool of young people that are really high achievers that are going to be great fits and really ambitious basketball players that dream big. Is our pool to pick from every year smaller because of our academics? Yes. But I think that's a good thing. It kind of narrows our list down to, and after being here 21 years, I know who we can recruit. And I know there's some young people I see and I watch and wow, he's a great player, but it's probably not going to be a great fit. No disrespect. Just not going to be a great fit. And so we move on quick to those that are great fits for us. And we have had all different aptitudes here. You know, I have had kids that have had SATs that are off the charts. And then I've had kids that have to fight and grind and scratch. And I, I'll mention two of them because they're two former players and are on my staff and they're unbelievable human beings, Harold Swanigan and Ryan Humphrey. School wasn't easy for them. But man, did they come in and work and we have great support and they are Notre Dame graduates and Notre Dame men. And, 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 and so you, you get a little bit of everything, um, but I never looked at it as, oh my gosh, we can't be as successful or competitive because of admissions. I look at it as it earmarks who really is a good fit for our place. That, that totally makes sense. And obviously it hasn't affected you too much because you've had incredible success in Notre Dame football as well as had and Notre Dame women's basketball. And so you're getting it done. Next thing I, I want to ask is you're such a good teacher of the game and you teach the game, you teach things about life. And so I was wondering, if, you know, if you could tell me, you know, what are some of the lessons that you feel the game has taught you or your players have taught you over the years? You being a teacher, what have you learned from it? Well, you make a great point. I think you learn so much from your students, especially when you have juniors and seniors every year. I learn so much from Rex Fluger, TJ Gibbs, and Johnny Mooney as the season went. I listened to them. I wanted their feedback on – how we were handling our group, X and O wise, playing zone, well, you know, what we do on the ball screen. And, and, I, and I love those relationships. As guys get older in our program, they become, the relationship with me becomes different. And they almost become player coaches sometimes. They really do with the feedback and the trust that we have with each other. So, um, you know, there's nothing like seeing a group of young people celebrate and smile after doing something together. And I think when you're the leader of that, you cherish that. Those are burnt in my mind, you know, the smiles. Now, just as much the tough nights when we have not done well. And I've challenged them in the locker room after a game. And they handle it like a man and look you in the eye and bounce back and the real life stuff. So um, it just, you know, I'm 61, but it keeps me young doing this and being around these guys. And that's one of the things that's so frustrating with COVID that I can't be in the locker room or on the court with my guys. Like, that's what I cherish. It's, it energizes all teachers when you get to be around your students and you feel the juice coming off of them. I'm not get, I just can't do it by way of Zoom. So I want them back quick. <laughs> I hear you, man. So I'm going I'm to close up with this. Is, uh, one of the things I always ask when people come on is I usually try to bring on people that have had some sort of success. And so you've obviously been successful in high school, college, multiple, multiple Final Fours, NCAA appearances, Coach of the Years, all that. So, you know, are there any daily habits or routines that you feel that you do in your life that you feel contributes to your success? You know, I'm a big workout guy, staying in shape. And I've really challenged myself in COVID because I have even more time to control my diet and my exercise program to be by June 1st, not that I was in bad shape, but be in the best shape maybe I've been in the last 15 years. I think it clears your mind. My routine is even when we're back and during the season in January and I've got Duke and Virginia coming at me, get up, get a workout in, clear your mind and, and get your energy up. I, 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 I can't say how important that has been to my routine. When I'm working out in the morning before I go to the office, I'm thinking through my practice plan. 
I'm thinking through my strategy. Nobody can come at me and talk to me. I've got some privacy to think creatively. But, you know, we pace our players. Hey, we're going to shorten practice today because we don't want them to be tired for the game. We've got a strength coach. It's every bit the responsibility of the leader to have the physical energy and be able to keep up. So I work out to get ready for a basketball season just like my guys do. So can you get on the court and hoop with your guys? No, I don't do that anymore because I, I know I'll take one step and blow my Achilles out at 61. So I, I'm big into Pilates. I'm a big swim guy. You know, I walk this neighborhood every morning. And what's great, the, the positives of COVID, and there's, well, there's really none, but you can, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking at home and controlling my diet better. And, and, and that's really been a key. But no, no more hooping, but I may play horse with them a little bit. Maybe just a horse game. <laughs> yeah, I gave up hooping as well. That, that blown Achilles, that was me a couple of years ago. So I'll do, that's much... a long way back. God bless you. <laughs> exactly right. Well, before we close up, I do want to, uh say some just from a personal note is that you know with me being from south bend man it, it's first of all it's an honor to talk to you but i want to say thank you and what i mean by that is when i was growing up like we talked about notre dame had a little gap in success right and so from 90 till 2000 those were some of my formative years you know that was eighth grade through college and when i think about notre dame now the level of success the pride that I have for Notre Dame and for, for my home city. When I think about, you know, th there was a long time, it was just Notre Dame football coaching grades. But when I think the people around my age, I mean, we remember Digger Phelps, Lou Holtz, Coach McGraw, Brian Kelly, and Mike Bray. Like that, that's who it is. And what you've done for the community in terms of fundraising, in terms of bringing pride back to the basketball program, the, the business side of it, all the, the money that comes in for hotels and the money invested in that community. You've helped out so many people and given pride to the community and me, me being from South Bend, just want to say thank you, man. And I, I appreciate what you've done for my community and my people. Well, I love the band. And as we refer to it up here, right? The band, I got off the airplane. I was in Florida and they got a sign up in the airport. Now, welcome to the band. Exactly. I took a picture of it, sent it to my son because you know, my kids grew up here. They're off now and living their own lives. And um, this was where I raised my family. And I, I'm really kind of one of the neighbors in this town now. You know, I go to Martin's or I go to a restaurant. Hey, what's up, coach? And I love that. They, I, they've seen me forever. And, and so really proud of this community. It's amazing, as you know, being a native, how it's changed and improved over the last 20 years. And by the way, your reputation as a player is still out there. I know about you. I hear about you. I know, I know, I know you could hoop back in a day here in Michiana. Um, but uh, when you come back to visit, please make sure you stop by. Uh, I'd love to say to hi personally at our offices. I will take you up on that because I have season tickets for uh, football. Anybody that knows me knows how big of a fan I am. And so I'm up there a couple times a year for Notre Dame football game. So I'm going to take you up on that, Coach. You could tailgate with us. And hopefully that first home game is in September. Fingers crossed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. So, man, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And I really appreciate it. You know, good luck to you next year, Coach. And uh, thank you. Thanks again. Marcus, you stay safe, man. Go Irish. I right, appreciate it. Thank you, Coach Bray, for coming on. And once again, good luck to you. I am going to take you up on that, on that offer to come in and tailgate with you guys for Notre Dame football game. Hopefully we'll have football in the fall with fans in the stadium, therefore I can come up there. But good luck to you, and thanks for coming on. Moving on, next week we'll have, we'll go back to the Missouri Valley Conference and bring in one of the good young coaches. He's only going to be going into his second year. Brian Mullins was a great player for Southern, was on the Loyola staff that went to the Final Four. So you notice I'm bringing some coaches in. They don't just talk about it. Like, they've been to Final Fours, and they, they've had success. And Coach Mullins is going to do a great job at Southern, got off to a really good start last year, and is going to continue to build that program. So I think you guys should tune in. And he's a great guy, but also a good young coach. So make sure you tune in and hear what he has to say. And even after that, you know, we got Brad Brunel from Clemson coming on, Damon Stoudemire, former pro, who's now the head coach at Pacific, quite a few more people. So, again, we're just going to keep bringing the content with us going back to once a week. It'll get spread out a little bit further, but make sure you chime in on Wednesdays and you'll get great content here at the Details of Life. With that being said, you know, I love how these coaches are just coming in. They're not giving a whole bunch of cookie cutter answers. They're telling you what it takes. They're telling you about culture. They're telling you about how to turn the season around. Some of the things they do, you all notice all these coaches are talking about 
staying in shape, working out, keeping their mind fresh, keeping their mind right. So make sure you take these bits of knowledge and the details they're giving you, because you know what? That's right. Greatness is in the details, guys. Continue to like, subscribe, and share. Come back, spread the word, have more people join us. Let's keep growing. And I can't wait to see you guys next episode. See you next week. Peace.